on. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us as we as we are rolling a little bit late into this morning's session. And welcome back to the 2020 Texas Health Literacy Conference. We are on the fourth day of this conference and going strong. It's presented by the Health Collaborative in collaboration with Texas Doctors for Social Responsibility. I'm Jordan McElveen, Community Data and Information Manager at the Health Collaborative, a network of citizens, community organizations, and businesses working to improve the health of the community through collaborative means. We're very excited to offer 100% virtual conference experience this year, all the way through October 16th, this Friday. We will save time for questions at the end of the session, so please type your questions into the Q&A box and feel free to engage with one another in the chat bar as well. I'm very excited to introduce our presenter for this session, Stephen Lucky, the founder and CEO of Gardovia Gardens. And a San Antonio native, Stephen holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from the University of the Incarnate Word and Master's of Arts in Nutrition from the University of the Incarnate Word. Stephen earned his organic farmer certification in the spring of 2019 and is currently a NASA Community College Aerospace Scholar. Very cool. And if you follow them on social media, you can see there's no shortage of awesome things that he's up to. So welcome, Stephen, and thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much, Jordan. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> to all those attendees, um, thank you for joining us and hanging on while we had our sort of technical difficulties. But I'm happy uh, to talk a little bit about Gardopia and talk about what we are doing in San Antonio to address food insecurity, to address climate change, to address environmental health. Um, Gardopia was founded approximately five years ago. And since that point in time, we've been able to build about 100 gardens. We've grown about 5,000 pounds of produce, and we've had an impact on over 10,000 uh, individual people during that time. Um, I'm going to get a little bit in depth into some of our programs that we use uh, to utilize um, to address some of those issues that we're experiencing in our community. Um, and I'm also going to give a tour of our micro farm here on the east side. Uh, before I get into that, I wanted to show a short little promo video. So Susan, could you go ahead and play that? Stephen Lucky took a college nutrition class and learned how low-income San Antonio residents lack access to healthy food. He decided to help create gardens to fuel healthy eating. I have a fever and the only prescription is more gardening. That's what sparked my fire of wellness is we are fat, we are a fat nation, we're eating too much, we're not exercising. Lucky started fast. He worked with college administrators to launch a garden at the University of the Incarnate Word. Then he worked with Professor Jeff Crane for an educational youth garden program at a local community center. Gardens could be used in academics interdisciplinary. When you do something hands-on, tangible, you're working with it, retention of knowledge can increase. He wanted to do more. He learned that Eastside Promise neighborhood leaders had grant funding for new health projects, and he successfully pitched a plan to create a community garden on land donated by the San Antonio Housing Authority. He also developed a plan to revamp an elementary school's garden and add a gardening curriculum, and got buy-in from the principal. He recruited volunteers and local support to start community and school gardens. By us going into the garden and working with these students, we were increasing their physical activity and we were increasing access to fruits and vegetables. He wanted to unify these many gardening efforts. It was really bigger than me. I wanted it to be something bigger than Stephen going out and gardening at these schools. I wanted it to, to be a garden utopia. So in 2016, he created a nonprofit, Gardopia Gardens. This allowed him to sustain the community garden and expand the student gardening curriculum to additional schools. Students maintain gardens, learn math and science tie-ins, and harvest fresh produce to take home or use in school recipes. Our mission of Gardopia Gardens is to educate people about the importance of practicing wellness in their daily lives to create a healthier society. And we do that through our main principles of education, health, and nutrition. This is my first time working in the garden and what I like about it is working together as a team with everybody. It's good for kids to plant vegetables because you could take them out and harvest them and you could eat the vegetables because it helps you with your muscles and your body. I think it's really important to give them that opportunity because especially in the city and urban areas there's not a lot of you know gardens and farms and whatnot so they actually get to see more than just reading about it in the books where their food comes from. Stephen eventually wants to add a wellness center
Susan, we lost sound on that. Should we roll back over to Steven? All right, sorry everybody, we're just getting reconnected. Looks like our Zoom thread just dropped off, so we just need to get reconnected and we'll be back rolling. Go ahead. Okay, we're good to go. I think so. We can see you and we can hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Well, hopefully, y'all enjoyed y'all enjoyed that video. That was a partnership with UT Health San Antonio and their salute, um, a salute America. I think is what they're going with now. Um, so, sort of to backtrack a little bit. It was in 2010 that I was uh, studying nutrition and just be became appalled by understanding about obesity, uh, sedentary lifestyles, and essentially a preventable disease, right? Like there, there are a lot of genetically predisposed diseases, um, you know, cancer, we haven't figured that out, but the being overweight and having two thirds of adults overweight and one third of adults obese is, I, I believe, a significant problem. And we're having a lot of discussions, and we've been having a lot of discussions about healthcare, universal healthcare, Obamacare. Like, there's all these different healthcare plans. But in my opinion, the first space of healthcare is in what we eat. Um, and Hippocrates, the founder of West, Western medicine, says, Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. And so that was really what I wanted to address. And I thought that the best way to do that is to grow a percentage of our food. It is estimated, um, you know, by un the United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization, that a large percentage, or about I think 20% of land by 2040, is going to be non-arable. That means that we're not going to be able to grow food on it. Uh, what does that mean, especially for people in the equatorial region, uh, where temperatures are continuing to rise? That means there could be mass migration. So, in addition to the health issues that we're experiencing, we're also experiencing a climate crisis or a climate change or environmental degradation, however you want to refer to it. Um, and 
working in our food system, we can address some of those issues. But it starts at the bottom with education, and that's really where Gardopia focuses in. So I'm going to pull up a little slideshow, so keep me on track a little bit. Let's see here. Presents on this device. Actually, share my content, share my screen. Start broadcast. Two. Okay, so can y'all see my screen? We can see it. Perfect. Yeah, looks good. So y'all just saw that video. Um, here we go. So essentially, once I got this idea sparked in my head, I was able to get started pretty quickly. Um, we started a garden at University of Incarnate Word. And then in 2013, we were able to partner with the Eastside Promise neighborhood. Now, the Eastside Promise neighborhood was an initiative by President uh, Barack Obama, where he initiated what are called Promise Zones. And these Promise Zones are economically depressed regions um, that they're trying to incentivize public and private investment. And so there's, I think, a Promise Zone, and there's like 13 Promise Zones. Uh, Los Angeles, I think there's one in Kansas City. Uh, there was one on a Navajo reservation. So they're all throughout the United States. And so the city of San Antonio, I think uh, Trinity University, United Way, and the San Antonio Housing Authority were able to come together to apply for a federal grant. And they received it. It was a five-year grant. I think it was $52 million. Hello, tell me you can still hear okay. me. You're back. Yes, okay, sorry, y'all can hear me. We can hear you, we can see you. Okay. Oh my goodness, I almost had a heart attack. Okay, so um, I was speaking about um, the Promise Neighborhood. Um, so $52 million where they were able to get 26 million for housing and 26 million for education. And that allowed for a, a bevy of things to occur. Um, in the education side, they had different metrics. And one of those metrics was access to fresh fruits and vegetables and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. So they definitely partnered with the San Antonio Food Bank. Uh, they started a farmer's market. There was fresh produce distributions. But we also tried a different approach, which was garden-based learning and working with the children's garden at Ella Austin. That was in 2013. Um, the garden was a hit. You know, one of the things about gardening, especially with youth, it's just the switch in the way that they learn, right? So much of our learning is indoors. So much of our learning now is on the computer. And that's not who we evolved as humans, right? Like we grew up uh, over millennia outside connecting to nature. So this shift towards more of a sedentary lifestyle has significantly affected our body composition as well as our mental health. I'm not a mental health professional, so I really can't speak on that. Um, but there is research and studies showing that getting outside, seeing greenery, um, touching the soil benefits your mental health in addition to your physical health. And so that was just a reaffirmation from what we had done with college students at Incarnate Word. So garden-based learning was attractive. It was engaging at the higher ed level. And then we were seeing the same results replicated at the K through six level. And it was at that point in time that I knew that there was a niche for this to be expanded. But you, in San Antonio, and it's not just San Antonio, but if you drive uh, around the city, you're going to see quite a few gardens. You're gonna see community gardens, you're going to be school gardens. You're going to see school gardens. The issue is keeping these gardens maintained because a teacher's a teacher, a principal's a principal, a janitor's a janitor, and nobody has gardening in their job description. Now, every once in a while, you'll get that teacher who's grew up on a farm and she's like, all right, we're going to use this space. Um, but what happens when that teacher leaves? What happens when that teacher uh, leaves for maternity or paternity leave? Um, what happens when that teacher is asked by the principal to focus on the STAR test? 
Well, guess what? The garden goes to the wayside. And so what Gardopia is trying to do around garden-based learning is to make it easy for the school, make it easy for the district, make it easy for the teacher, make it easy for that parent, right? There might be a, um, what is it? The uh, PTA, Parent Teacher Association. There may be somebody in that who really wants to take leadership but doesn't know how to garden, right? They know how to get the troops together. They know how to organize. But the expertise of growing food and integrating it into academic curriculum um, is a whole nother task. And so that's really where we were able to come in with Gardopia um, and officially make Gardopia a, a 501c3 in 2015. We were able to work with Bowden Elementary, which y'all saw in the video, uh, Carol Head Start as well. Um, and all of this was in partnership with the University of the Incarnate Word, um, specifically in the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, as well as um, in nutrition and biology, uh, chemistry. We even had some religion courses. And it was a beautiful mixture of college students being able to apply the skills that they were learning in the classroom to the youth. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, three-year-olds and four-year-olds in Head Start. You know, we had, we had uh, eight-year-olds in second grade at Bowden. Um, at Ella Austin, we had all the way up to sixth grade. And then in the summers, we had high schoolers. And time and time again, um, students would prefer, especially when the weather's good, uh, being outside. But how do we how do we turn the garden into an engaging space? And that is is a whole nother task. Um, and that's something that we've been working on is, is the curriculum side. Now there are a lot of great organizations out there uh, that are doing some great work. And I'll get out, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, speeding up a little bit. In 2015, we were founded in May. And about five months later, the San Antonio Housing Authority reached out to us in which there were two vacant lots. These two vacant lots were on a high crime corridor that Saha had received a separate grant, 600,000, to essentially reduce crime along these corridors. And they partnered with us to do something called SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, in which we were able to take these half this half acre and create a headquarters. And I'll show you the headquarters shortly. Um, we've been able to totally transform the space. Um, past that, starting to partner with San Antonio ISD and Alamo Heights ISD, um, we were awarded a garden-based learning grant with United Way in 2017. Um, in 2018, we partnered with Parks and Recreation at Woodard Park to start a, or to revive a community garden. And then in 2019, which is really a capstone for us, and I'll speak a little bit in depth on this, we partnered with Alamo Colleges, ACOG, Alamo Area Council of Governments, and Morgan's Wonderland. And we did a 10-week workforce development program with 16 to 24 year old uh, intellectually and de developmentally delayed students. And I tell you what, this was just such an eye opening. We hadn't taught really a special ed class focus um, up until that point in time. Um, but these students were extremely high functioning. And the idea was we were training them not only to improve their health literacy, but also allowing them to go into the workforce, right? So they could go work for a nursery. They could go work for a landscaping company. They could maybe go work for an organization, a garden-based learning company like Gardopio. And seeing their eyes light up, um, seeing them really take to it, it just, again, just time after time, each population that we work with, um, the results seem to be replicated from the retention of knowledge. Um, and then we're not, we haven't, we haven't done a longitudinal study yet to figure out is garden-based learning affecting, improving people's uh, physical um, composition, right? Their physical health. So as far as testing BMIs, body weight, looking at body fat percentages, maybe even doing some blood testing, that's, that would really be the next step for us is to be testing anatomical and physiological biomarkers to test that side, as well as the mental health aspect. And so we're currently um, we just finished a, a project with Metro Health, San Antonio Metro Health at a women's infant and children's teaching clinic. And we're in discussions with uh, Young Men's Leadership Academy and Young Women's Leadership Academy to do a longitudinal study. So we can really start creating some um, evidence-based uh, data to advocate for more of these programs. Because a lot of times what happens is, 
you know, HEB, the Spurs, Whole Foods, all these great organizations, they'll get gardens started, right? They'll give a $5,000 grant, $10,000 grant to get these spaces going. But then what happens after year one, year two, year three? A lot of times those resources go away. And so when those resources go away, then the energy, the desire to continue cultivating these spaces goes away. So when we talk about making these effective um, educational tools, we have to have the resources behind them. And that's it. That's for everybody, right? Everybody needs funding. Um, but in addition to the funding, we also need to make sure that that um, continuing education is happening in those institutions. Um, Y'all are all here at the Texas Health Literacy Conference. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, y'all. That's okay. Y'all are all at the Texas Health Literacy Conference. So y'all are aware of the problem. And I've spoke about the problem. Um, it's only increasing. I was just reading an article yesterday that said, I think it's Oaxaca. Uh, Mexico has, I believe, 70% uh, adults or their population is overweight and 30 plus percent is obese. And so what are they doing to address the problem? They are banning the sale of junk food to minors, right? So they, so children cannot buy, I guess, candy and chips and soda. So there are different ways that we can address the problem. Here in San Antonio and here in America, it's it's been difficult to take actions like that because you know some people feel that we're stepping on their liberty to consume whatever they want. Um, but again, that's where our education comes in in the classroom at a very young age, right? It's it's difficult to, as they say, teach an old dog new tricks. But if we can start at five years old, pre-K for SA, I think pre-K for SA has gardens in all of their four schools, right? So we start at pre-K four years old, and we just hammer kids over the head with nutrition, with garden-based learning, and we integrate it as project-based learning. We're integrating STEM, we're integrating uh, soil science, we're integrating ecosystems, we're integrating biodiversity, we're integrating math. There is so much math in the garden, but we can all tie it all back to food. We're always talking about food. So, you know, what is five apples times uh, five apple trees? Each apple tree is going to give me you know, five apples and I, ha I planted five. So in five years, I'm going to have 25 apples per season, right? So those, that's, is, that's a really basic example. And we can continue scaling it up. Again, when we get at the collegiate level, continuing to incorporate food into our learning, um, there's, there's many opportunities for research as well. Um, since we've been um, at Gardopia, I think I mentioned we've built about 100 gardens. We have something called partner gardens where these are gardens that we continually provide maintenance and upkeep to. As you can see, most of them are in the urban core, um, but we do have a few uh, in more of the midtown, and then we have a couple on the south side as well. Um, one of the biggest things we do to be successful in our educational programs is consistency. And so when we're working with schools, when we're doing volunteer days, Gardening isn't like a one-time thing. We can't just show up one time and then boom, you know, the light goes on. I understand why I need to be healthy. I understand why I need to take care of the environment. I understand nutrition. I understand macronutrients. I understand micronutrients, right? I understand why I need to be hydrated. That cannot happen by from one touch. And so what we really try to do is maintain that consistency and be with our partner gardens every week, every month, every quarter, so that that knowledge is continually being dispersed. Um, I don't know if anybody is a gardener here or a farmer, um, but we use something called drip line irrigation. And so again, this is a, I guess this is a little bit of a math, a little bit of a science, a little bit of engineering, right? So drip line irrigation is a tube. It looks like a hose. It can be brown, it can be black, and it has an emitter. It has an emitter usually every 12 to 18 inches. These emitters release 0.9 gallons per hour. Let's just call it a gallon, a gallon per hour. And the reason they do that is because plants prefer drinking at a slow rate, right? Nobody just drinks all their water at once. They drink their water over time. So if we 
extrapolate that or look at that from the educational side, we too need to be dripping that knowledge, dripping that information slowly. Because when we work in these classes, um, that consistency allows for that retention of knowledge. We have four programs that we utilize to achieve our goals of educating people about healthy lifestyles. Um, we have garden volunteer days. So what that looks like is people coming to the garden and doing hands-on projects. So it's not direct academic setting education, but what it becomes is an indirect uh, on-the-job experience. So if we're doing an installation, if we're moving soil, if we're moving mulch, if we're feeding the chickens, if we're harvesting eggs, if we're harvesting honey. So it really allows people to um, immerse themselves, right? Most people are kinesthetic learners. And so I can tell you all day, you know, the process of how bees um, create their hives and how they create honey. But when you open up that beehive, and you see that honeycomb, right? And you see the, all those insects working in harmony with a population of over 50,000. It's just mind blowing. Um, chickens, you know, when you build that chicken coop and you're taking care of those chickens and you wake up in the morning and you come to school and you open, you know, that cage and you're harvesting eggs, or if you're at your house or if you're in a homeschooling situation, um, there's nothing like it harvesting that broccoli. And so that's what a lot of times is what is happening on the volunteer days, either at Gardopia, but we also assist with that at our partner gardens. Um, the garden-based learning, that is implicit education. Uh, we usually do about 45 minute classes to an hour, and that will include a hybrid. It'll be usually 50-50, 50% in the classroom, 50% um, outdoors. Now, at different times of the year, it could be 100% in the classroom, and sometimes it'll be 100% outside. It really depends on where we are at in the timeline of the construction and the implementation of the curriculum at that school. Um, so in the beginning, I'm doing a lot of in-class work. I'm laying the, the foundation for why we're even here. Why are we starting a garden? Why are we continuing a garden? Why are we adding a composter? Why are we adding a chicken coop? Why are we building 10 more raised beds? How? How are we going to build these beds? Um, with what materials? Uh, a really good practice I like to go through is budgeting with the students. You know, what, we, ha we have a $10,000 budget. What are we, we going to prioritize? What do we want to grow first? We talk about the seasonal aspect. Um, on the STAR test, you know, one of the issues people struggle with is the difference between weather and climate, right? So there are some things that we can um, really get at. Same thing with perimeter, surface area, and volume. Um, on the nutrition side, again, understanding the difference between macro and micronutrients can be a little advanced. Um, of course, using the, the USDA MyPlate is a great tool. Um, and then there's also some really great resources out there. Um, one of the Great resources if you're interested in learning a little bit more about garden-based learning is the Edible Schoolyard. So the Edible Schoolyard was started by uh, Alice Louise Waters about 23 years ago, 24 years ago in Berkeley, California. And so it's interesting, right? Berkeley is probably one of the wealthiest uh, regions, maybe in the country, um, very, you know, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, all that. But they don't fund their uh, public school. Surprise, surprise. And so Alice was a restaurateur. She started a, a restaurant called Chez Panisse. She would drive past this middle school um, every day. And it was dilapidated, just running down, MLK Middle School. So she went to the principal and she said, hey, can I turn this parking lot into a garden? It was a one acre parking lot. He's like, sure, go ahead. Um, fast forward 22 years later, um, she has a staff of three educators, uh, three garden educators, three cooking or three chefs, um, and then her admin staff, a one acre space, all 1000 students at MLK middle school go through the garden based learning program. They spend two weeks per year in the garden based learning program. And then when they go to high school, they're able to come back to as interns to the edible schoolyard. So she's really created that continuity. If you go to her website, edibleschoolyard.org, I believe, um, she has a plethora of free 
open source educational resources uh, for K through 12 and higher ed, multiple subjects. Um, she has health subjects, she has science subjects, reading. So I would really encourage you to utilize that. Uh, beyond that is uh, Bear County, or I'm sorry, Texas A&M AgriLife. Um, here in Bear County, we have uh, Bear County Master Gardeners as well. They're a really good source. The Botanical Gardens is a good source as well um, to just get deeper into it. And if you want to take a training and then also Palo Alto College has a horticulture program. Um, and so if you're interested in doing some continuing education, those are some great opportunities. Um, with Gardopia, you know, we're providing certifications and CU courses. We also do workshops for adults on the weekend. Um, we build gardens, which is half the battle, right? Getting your getting your um, setup up and running is, is a challenge and figuring out how to make it low maintenance. Um, one of the reasons people give up on gardening is because it, it takes time, right? It's, it, there's a lot of sweat equity in it. And so usually kids don't have a problem getting outside and, and working, but they need to have that adult there with the subject matter ex expertise to make sure that they're doing the installation correctly. We're adding soil when we need to add soil, we are fertilizing when we need to fertilize. So having that build a garden component is really important. And then farmer's market. Um, we have been going to the Pearl Farmer's Market, um, but another way to approach that is at the school level, at the educational level, um, having farmer's markets at, you know, at the school, right? Um, Wheatley Middle School for a while was having that. When we were at Ella Austin, um, the San Antonio Food Bank was bringing some farmer's markets there. That brings the educational tool of the economic piece as well. So for health, um, knowing about health is one thing, but having the resources to, to lead a healthy lifestyle is another thing. I was talking to uh, a friend yesterday and he said his 11 year old daughter just loves the garden, right? She'll go out there, she'll watch everything grow. Well, he said it was time to harvest. And one morning he woke up and he went outside and everything was gone. All of the produce was gone. And then his daughter comes back a little bit later and she has 50 bucks. He's like, what happened to the food? She's like, oh, I went and sold it to our neighbors. So, you know, creating that entrepreneurial spirit, showing that the garden, in addition to our physical health, maybe it could create some economic health for us as well. Um, you know, during this pandemic, food security has become a really big issue, right? Um, San Antonio is now notorious for the San Antonio food bank lines that um, were, you know, national news. So how do we increase access to fresh fruits and vegetables? Well, there's different approaches. And the approach right now that pretty much every city takes is we're going to give out food boxes. Giving out food boxes is great. It's immediate. It's emergency, right? Nobody can wait for a harvest of 60 to 90 days to be able to eat, eat food, right? So we have to have that stopgap in place. But as we look to the future, and, I, and again, I talked about mass migration, we know that Americans are overfed, uh, but malnourished. Well, we can address this long term by increasing urban agriculture within these cities, right? So in my opinion, every vacant lot, every schoolyard, every public park should be growing food. That's the best way to reconnect people to their food. If they realize where the food is coming from, then we can start to have those discussions about what it is that we're eating. Because a lot of times we're eating what we're provided as a youth. And so you can't necessarily go to the store and buy an apple. But if you're riding your bike down the park or past the schoolyard and there's an apple tree or an orange tree, then you have the freedom as a child to go and make healthier decisions. And so the more that we can release the food from HEB, and from Walmart, which, you know, great companies, they're doing awesome stuff. Thank you for their support to the community. But we can't have this duopoly or monopoly situation or, around food. Uh, Tulane University coined the term food swamps in 2013. And so that also starts to go into this discussion about what is the, what is the systemic issue of what we're eating and how that relates to health, right? So it's not necessarily that we're in a desert of the sense of there's not enough food. There may not be enough healthy food. And so we're stuck in this swamp where every direction we turn, there's unhealthy options. 
And if we're not getting a lot of nutrition education, if we have no clue where our food is grown, then it's going to be very difficult for us to get out of these systemic behavioral problems that we're all experiencing, myself included. Um, I want to show you real quick what North New Braunfels looks like again. Increasing urban agriculture in the, in the city is what we're trying to do. So this is what the property looks like, you know, loitering, trash, like you would, who would want to be there? I wouldn't want to be there. And this is what we've been able to turn it into over the past few years. We have events, we have movie nights. And so health, and I know we're at the health literacy conference and I really want to touch on that. Um, there are many factors of health, health, right? So there's dimensions of wellness and wellness and health can be synonymous. Um, in addition to the physical, the nutritional, the environmental benefits of health of these gardens, there's also social health, right? The interaction. And right, of us, right now, a lot of us are in social isolation, right? A lot of us are working from home, behind the screen, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, when COVID is over, everybody needs to go get involved in a community or school garden. And I, and I say that with true sincerity because the the people that are brought together in these spaces is healing in itself. Uh, this is a project we did with Woodard Park. They had some raised beds. That's what a lot of school gardens look like. How can I teach health when I'm growing grass? None of us are cows, so we're not going to eat this grass. That was the spring break program we did with the city of San Antonio Parks and Recreation. You know, the kids are running around in the garden, they're watering the garden, they're planting seeds, they're coming back and checking on it. Um, the stimulation that is derived from these outdoor classrooms, um, I, I think is second to none. So what I wanna do now is, um, let's see here, stop. Okay, so. I want to go now to a little tour. Let's see what time it is. It's. You still got time. Okay. Yeah. What? Oh, it's nine fifty one. Okay. Cool. Cool. Nine fifty one. Um. So, so now what I want to do is show you all Gardopia a little bit closer. We're working on some different projects. Um, this project right here is our baby. It's called the Meme Lab. It's called the Microgreen Eatery and Mushroom Education Laboratory. And what it is, it's a 40 foot shipping container. It's gonna have four different sections. This section right here is what the meme lab is. Again, microgreen eatery and mushroom education laboratory. And this is going to, this is our way to answer COVID-19. We know people need food and they need it fast. So how do we get people healthy food fast? Well, microgreens can be high in protein and carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and they can grow in one week, seven days. I can sow seeds in seven days. So that means if I sow seeds on Monday, I'm eating the next Monday. That's critical, right? Uh, mushrooms, mushrooms are nutrient dense. They are a good meat alternative and they have vitamins, minerals. They grow in three weeks. So I can plant mushrooms at the beginning of the month and before the month is over, I'm gonna be eating mushrooms. If I don't know if anybody has had Oyster mushrooms, oh my goodness, they're so good. They taste like chicken, literally. Um, portobello mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, right? All these different items that are can be high dollar too. Again, we talk about the economic value of these items. If you go buy two portobello mushrooms at HEB, you're looking at about five, six bucks, right? So can we lower those costs and educate our community? Education is key. Every business that goes into business goes out of business. So Gardopia is not going to be here forever. While we are here, can we create the capacity within our community to have the knowledge and know-how to be able to do it themselves? Right here is a kitchen. This is going to be the nutrition kitchen is what we're calling it. And the nutrition kitchen hopefully is going to be funded by Baptist Health Foundation. We have a site visit on Wednesday. Is going to be able to take the microgreens the mushrooms, um, any anything else that we're growing and directly process it. So we're going to have juices, smoothies, teas, and fresh salads. There is no healthy restaurant um, east of 
uh, what is it? East of Cherry Street, right? So here we are, there's corner stores, there's Jack in the Boxes, there's Little Caesars, but there are no healthy options. So we're happy to be one of the first healthy options on the east side in probably a long time. Um, and then it'll have an office and a restroom, so that's not too exciting. Um, right here is a, a rain garden. Um, it's a beautiful space. Uh, creates a biodiverse ecosystem. There's over 30 different species in here. And this is all from just a little hole that we dug and what it's been able to turn into. Uh, we have a pollinator garden as well. It's a little overgrown right now, but again, all the monarchs are coming right now. Um, this is the migration season. We started a green wall. So this is a green wall of grapes. This is filling out very, very well. And we also planted asparagus. So this is all asparagus is growing which is like crazy it's doing amazing asparagus asparagus all right here so we're gonna have asparagus and grapes which are both perennials and grow year-round and then we also planted trees these are citrus trees remember what this looked like before it was just a parking lot nothing and so to turn it from a parking lot to a food forest this is our community garden right here so we have some radish that are come up and coming oh look at them and again, microgreens. I can just eat these radish greens like they are now, or I can let them go. We have some, uh, some cabbage. We have some cauliflower growing as well. Uh, these are beans right here. It's actually a cover crop. Um, we're trying to put some nitrogen back into the soil, but the beans are doing very well. We have some peppers. We have a few tomatoes as well. And then we have our composters. We have some fruit trees, apple trees. We have our figs. These are hugel mounds right here. We harvested a ton of sweet potatoes. You can see our figs are up and coming. Um, we have some chickens right here. Uh, our chickens produce pretty much daily, so we're able to get fresh eggs. Uh, we have some rabbits as well. Um, rabbits are a great source of protein if needed. Um, and then we have our nursery. And then back here, we have um, our bees. We have two beehives as well, so we're getting fresh honey um, from the space. So I want to go ahead and stop talking. And if are there any questions um, about Gardopia or our programs or you know our our implementation of uh, garden-based learning to address some of the health inequities in our city? Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. I'll take some questions from the audience. We had a few comments uh, while you're walking around um, from some folks. Irene said the, the North New Braunfels Garden is a beautiful oasis and she loves seeing it when she's in the area. Um, some other folks who are interested in getting involved in lots of um, comments that it's so beautiful, which it is. So it's awesome to have you outside walking around during our conference today. Um, and amazing just what you and your team have been able to grow since 2012. Um, it looks like there's been some great community support um, behind that mission. So I'm kind of yes, curious. Yes. Uh, oh, we have a question that popped up. How do we get involved? Um, so they can go to our website, gardopiagardens.org. They can send me an email, lucky at gardopiagardens.org. They can call me, 210-478-7292. Uh, they can message us on Instagram or Facebook at Gardopia Gardens, or they can come visit us at Gardopia Thursday evenings or Saturday mornings. Saturdays are 10 to 12. Thursdays are a little changing. It's about to hit daylight savings. Um, but right now we're doing 5.30 to 7.30 until November. And no November, we'll probably move it up 4 to 6 p.m. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm curious, I know, so the Gardopia's approach is through this, you know, hands-on education for, for children and young people. And I'm curious if through um, kids coming to the garden and getting these experiences and learning, have they, have you seen any stories or instances where they're taking that conversation home to their parents and grandparents? And how has that changed maybe the way that the family is making food choices or accessing food? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, so right now I have a UTSA intern studying architecture and she came to me earlier this year and was like, hey, I want to do a project to start a garden at my house, right? So that's her initiative um, as a 18, 19 year old saying, I want to bring this to my family. So from there, she's going to impact her entire um, 
family in the sense that she's starting this initiative, um, teaching about food logs, teaching about you know sunlighting and, and installation. Um, again, the other person I was talking about earlier, where this 11 year old daughter is just so enamored by the growing process, right? And so her, her energy and her enthusiasm is motivating the parents to install more gardens in their backyard. Um, we have quite a few kids at the Ella Austin Community Center who are taking it home to their parents as well. Uh, a little feel good story. Uh, we had a young man, kindergarten, uh, who was having some behavioral issues. He got kicked out of his charter school and he had to go back to public school. Um, and so no, nobody could really get to him, right? He was just sort of like, he would just sort of shut himself down um, until he went out to the garden. And when he turned onto the garden, his eyes lit up and all of the behavior issues ended, right? There was, there was no problems. And then his mom was like, thank you so much for introducing him to the garden. He just loves it so much. He's always talking about it when he comes home, this and that. So there, there's been many antidotal stories of, of the children encouraging their parents to start gardens at the house. And from there, increasing their access to fresh fruits and veggies and incorporating it into their meals at home. So awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, community gardening, it just really fills so many amazing spaces in, in our lives, like you mentioned, mental health, physical health, um, all sorts of things, Com building community and that sense of purpose and place. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing and um, for leading us in this conversation today and for sticking with us through some tech issues at the beginning. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh for those, but um, you know, again, thank you for having me here and y'all are always welcome to Gardopia and I look forward to partnering with y'all in the future. Thanks, Steven. And thanks to everyone who came today. Uh, we ask that you please complete the conference survey. It's gonna be linked right below the Crowdcast page um, on the conference site. And especially if you're looking for continuing education, that survey will link you to those credits. So the next session for this conference is following this session immediately after at 10 a.m. It's a community health worker recognition ceremony, followed by the National Hispanic Medical Association Texas chapters meeting about the impact of COVID-19 on border communities. And that's at 1 p.m. right here. So we will continue sessions through Friday, October 16th. And please check the conference website for the full schedule of the upcoming sessions. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you, everyone.